Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I love a little engagement. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning to everyone in the room. I am so excited for this conversation and so honored to be a part of it. We get the chance to sit down with two gentlemen, as we know, who have been called the fathers of the internet, and it gives us the opportunity to consider the history of the internet and to critically examine the current moment. Are you sure this just uh, doesn't, doesn't give you an opportunity to blame us for something? I make no promises, make absolutely no promises. <laughs> So their accolades are many and include both men being recipients of the U.S. National Medal of Technology, the ACM, Tur the ACM Turing Award, which of course is the Nobel Prize of Computer Science, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So please join me again in welcoming Ben Cerf and Bob Cam. So we're celebrating this year 50 years uh, since you published uh, the paper that documented the TCP IP protocol, which of course is one of the foundations of the internet. At the time you were creating it, did you realize it would be so transformative? What do you think? <laughs> I, actually, so my, my short answer to this is that we had had experience with the predecessor system called the ARPANET, which demonstrated packet switching was feasible. Bob was deeply involved in the development of that system. And so we had some experience with electronic mail, which got invented in 1971, if you can believe that. Uh, and uh, the social implications of email distribution lists had already started to show up. Uh, access, remote access to time sharing systems had happened. So by the time 1973 comes along, we've already had some experiences with the technology. So I think we. At least I felt like this was a really powerful thing, but I don't, would not claim to have been able to guess all the things that uh, happened after that. Bob, what about you? Well, you have to understand what we were trying to do at the time. Um, with the ARPANET, it was a research project to demonstrate that you could actually build a reliable, efficient uh, network to link computers because use of the telephone system with its circuits to you know, 10 or 20 seconds to set up a circuit. They had errors on the lines. It only went to one place at a time. Um, and so the goal was really to see if we could build a different kind of network and then eventually link the computers together. So it was really multiple projects in one. You could build a net and have no computers attached. You got the computers ready to be attached but no network. And that was a grand collaboration of a lot of people to make that happen, but it was research. We weren't trying to change the world. I don't think, I mean, I can't speak for Vince, but I don't think we were ever trying to change the world. We were just trying to do an interesting technical challenge. Like, could you get a rocket to the moon? That was a technical challenge. Well, how, how does that change the world? I don't know. Um, when the internet came along, um, I mean, the internet is very different from what that original network was. That was one network linking machines. We created a number of other nets. I was involved in most of them. Um, one of them was a packet radio net, which is really the forerunner of today's modern cell phone systems. Direct sequence spread spectrum, if you know what that is. If you don't, I'm not gonna explain it right now. Um, we had uh, also a satellite system to link together with our colleagues in Europe. Um, so we had linkages into England, Scandinavian countries, I think Germany, Italy, um, and the US, and a lot of connections over there. And the combination of those three nets, the ARPANET, the packet radio, and the packet satellite net was really where the internet came from. And that, in turn, was a research project as well. I mean, it had some end goals, like to connect to our research colleagues in Europe, but we weren't trying to change the world. Uh, at least I wasn't, and again, can't speak for Vint, but Little by little, you got to see this adoption. Oh my God, they're being, using it here. Oh my God, they're using it there. I remember seeing it for the first time on US television. You could send you know, messages to Tom Brokaw at NBC News, you know, the email address. Email itself wasn't so much new. I mean, we had telex before. Western Union could send telegrams, but the whole idea that you could manage it yourself and, and do it in real time, anytime you want. Uh, that, was a, that was a breakthrough that was not, not planned, 
And in fact, when DARPA supported it, that was one of the questions that was asked. You know, what's the goal? And the goal for them was to build a research community that could explore sharing computer resources. Turns out the main thing they shared were hardware resources, like big supercomputer, they had one called ILIAC, um, or big data centers, um, not like Google has today, but back then. They were places that could store a, a, a terabyte of data, and but you couldn't afford many. And the universities would spend a million dollars to buy a megabyte of memory. Think about that, a million dollars per megabyte. <laughs> and so if Harvard they gave us a proposal and said, could you give us a, you know, a big data store, we didn't want to have to then do the same thing for every other university. We wanted a network that would link them. So these were research challenges, but one of the biggest challenges was getting computer programs to interact with other computer programs. So you didn't have to re keep recreating them, and that is still a research challenge today in, in its largest context. There um, was so much in both of what, in what you both said that I would love to dive in deeper. This idea of spending a million dollars um, for just what we see now is just a small amount of data. It makes me think um, my funding proposals budget could be a lot larger than I'm asking for <laughs> um, these days. But I think also, you know, you touched on the importance of really tackling questions that are interesting and spending the time and the effort to really try to solve what are techno technically challenging problems and seeing then what the impact can go. You also touched on the importance of partnerships and connecting networks. So everyone in this room, well, most people, many people in this room have been here throughout the week, will be here today thinking about how can we have impact for our work? What should we th be thinking about going forward? In this um, moment of actionable impact um, and information management, what should we be thinking about? How should we be structuring ourselves, governing ourselves to really be setting ourselves up to continue uh, to create technology that really enables people? So you want to take the first crack at that? or would you I, like? Me yeah, to? I would, uh, because I have two words that I'd suggest should be guiding our thinking. One of them is accountability, and the other one is agency. And it's my sense that although there are technical challenges with regard to safety and security in the underlying infrastructure of the net, often those are being addressed by engineers in the Internet Engineering Task Force or at the ITU or IEEE or World Wide Web Consortium. But it's the application space that is the most difficult to deal with. It's what people do. It's people's behavior. So I think that identity is becoming increasingly critical. The notion of anonymity, while extremely attractive and under some circumstances is very important for whistleblowing and things like that, accountability requires some kind of a, uh, a way to identify parties and to hold them accountable for bad behavior. The other word, agency, speaks to in individuals and institutions and even governments about how they can protect themselves. What agency can we give them in order to protect uh, their interests and the interests of all the rest of us? So those two things are what guide most of my thinking in this uh, 21st century. Bob? So I have many things that occur to me, but I'm going to focus on two. One is an observation and the other is a specific suggestion. Uh, the observation is that uh, honoring a 50th anniversary of a technological contribution is pretty amazing to me. I mean, most things don't last that long. And the reason that the internet has survived partly is because we built the mechanisms. Mitt and I were both involved uh, in helping it to evolve and sustain itself. But more importantly, I think, was the design principles for the internet were sort of technology independent. It didn't depend upon what routers you're using. It depended on the functionality of these pieces. And so you could move from technology to technology to technology. And as long as they adhere to the basic architecture, it could continue to evolve and will continue to evolve. So that's really important. Now, the other thing I was going to mention is the title in your talk is Impact Data Summit. Data, to me, is something I can sink my teeth into. AI is not. Not that it isn't important. We used to fund most of the early AI when people thought AI was operating systems. It seemed very intelligent. You'd support all these users at one time when people used to batch processing. 
Um, but uh, artificial intelligence is like medicine or mathematics. It's, it's a broad discipline area. Could mean many different things, and it has meant many different things over the years. But data is out there, and we all know that data is going to play an important role, but we have a fundamental problem with the way we treat data today, is that the things you need to know about the data are not directly available with the data. You have to understand, somebody has to tell you, how is it formatted, where did it come from, what's the providence. Uh, it would be really nice if, and I'm going to lead to a conclusion here. Very nice if, if somebody showed up with a, a lot of data, your, your, your computer, let's see, somebody managed to send you a terabyte of sensor data, whatever it is. You could look at the data as it arrived and figure out what it was. You knew how it was formatted. Maybe you knew what sensors it came from, you know, and you could separately identify this and, and deal with it over the long time. Well, Vinta and I started to work on a, a, a notion of mobile programs in the internet that could take on responsibility for finding out things that you wanted to know. And although he, he ended up uh, going off and doing other things before we actually finished that work, we continued it at CNRI in, in the context of something we call the digital object architecture. And the whole notion of a digital object is, is data which has a unique persistent identifier. So you don't have to worry about saying what computer it's on, what route to get there, what file it's in, and the like. You can say, here is this string that uniquely identifies it. And not only does it identify it uniquely, it identifies it in perpetuity, as long as you manage the capabilities behind the scene to resolve it. So this is now being widely used in most of the major public Publishers in, in the world are now using it. Um, uh, I noticed you, you, that. You, you, I'm sorry to interrupt. You might want to remind people that if you've seen publications that have a reference at the bottom that say DOI, Digital Object Identifier, that's what this comes from. Yeah, and the Digital Object Identifier is one party's view of how to deal with it. We have, there's a group in China that's doing it for China, another group in Russia that's doing it for Russia. There are various groups in Africa doing it for Africa. We do it for the United States. I'd love to see it broadened out in the United States as well. But uh, the fact of the matter is, if we can get to the point where the data that we create in the future, because of its identity, allows you to get to all of this other stuff, the metadata about it, maybe even transactional records for people who own it, um, maybe identity-related things so you can secure it, make it interoperable. I think that's something we all ought to shoot for. It should be done on a global basis, uh, and it should be done with the same kinds of principles of technology independence that Ben and I created for the internet in the first place. And I also want to say that my wife, Patrice Lyons, who is here, has been very in influential in, in looking at some of the legal-related issues, including copyright and other things. And so she's been part of that process as well. We definitely appreciate a shout out to other people who have helped. And I think what you mentioned about the importance of the global aspect of this work, of the work that we are all doing, the work that we're all funding, the work that we're all advocating for is really important. Building on um, some of the points Doreen mentioned, uh, we're seeing a widening uh, digital divide across the world, and it's really important that as we think about doing this work that we invest globally and we build up capacity um, and capabilities around the world. I think, uh, Bob, you also mentioned um, the importance of things being interoperable um, and not being so technology dependent, but having the flexibility to really build and evolve um, on a common infrastructure, which I think is really important. Invent, I loved what you said about the values that we should be building on are accountability and um, agency. And so really making that the core of what we are building um, as we think about data for impact, as we think about the internet, as we think about use and governance of different technological uh, tools and systems that we are building and using today. 
I have many more questions for you, <laughs> but Arturo has had a sign up for the past couple of minutes that my, yeah. our time is up. Um, so Bob and Vint, thank you again so much for your time today. Thank you.